Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A big thank you to all our speakers and you, our attendees, for attending this forum this morning, taking out your time and joining us for today's event. Before we start off, we would also like to thank our sponsors for the forum this morning. Saojin, Jensen and Amgen. Welcome to the 8th National Myeloma Patient Forum. For those who are joining us for the first time, this is the 8th year we are organizing this event. And through this event, we hope to provide and to reach out to our myeloma patients and their caregivers and provide them with more information. Through this event, we also hope to provide a platform for our myeloma patients and their caregivers to interact and share experiences. Without further ado, let us now invite Professor Cheng Weiju, Director of NCIS, up on stage, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I think this is amazing. This is the eighth uh, Myeloma Patient Forum already. And I, as I look across to the audience, I can see a few things. One is that you know the, the number of attendees have been gradually growing over the years. I think the other amazing things is that I've seen patients and caregivers in the audience that have been here for all the eight years. You know, that just goes to tell you that um, you know, patients with myeloma is really living longer and longer now. This is definitely not the case uh, eight or ten years ago. Um, and I think this is down to, you know, the efforts uh, of people doing research in myeloma, the pharma company coming out with better treatment for the patients, uh, the awareness for the conditions going higher um, so that, you know, patients can uh, undergo treatment um, better, you know, the quality of the drugs are better. So I think overall we've made tremendous progress. But also what I'm particularly happy about is that the patients themselves have also uh, done tremendously well in getting themselves organized. As a result of these uh, annual forums, I think there are some very nice core groups that have emerged um, that actually on their own have been uh, running regular small groups uh, meetings and discussion where they can share um, their own experiences, help other patients go through this uh, journey. And I think that's particularly gratifying as well because it, it shows that um, you know, there, there's an emergence uh, of uh, a, a core patient group that um, is volunteering their time and effort to help uh, the whole community and other patients. So I think this program has achieved all these uh, important aims, and I, I think we hope to continue to do this uh, every year, uh, and hope to see all of you here uh, every year um, as well. So without much further ado, I think we have a nice program again this year, and I would like to invite um, Dr. Chandra Muli from uh, the SGH um, Hematology Department to tell us about uh, the current treatment landscape of myeloma in Singapore. Chandra. Uh, thank you very much, Viju. Thank you very much to everybody who um, uh, are here today uh, sparing your precious Saturday morning uh, with us. Uh, this is uh, my first uh, myeloma forum in Singapore, um, and you know I've, I've been around in Singapore for about three years now. Apologies for my long name, but I believe it is still shorter than my predecessor, Dr. Satish Kumar Gopalakrishnan. So, <laughs> in some ways, it's probably a bit easier for you, uh, for, my, for my patients to, and you can just call me Dr. Mauli. Okay, um, so uh, as has been. Uh, much of our uh, Singapore Myeloma Forum has been on YouTube videos and stuff, so I've uh, tried to go through some aspects of what has been covered and try and avoid some, but some uh, unfortunately had to be repeated for the sake of patients who have not been there in the previous forums and so on. So let's just uh, start talking about myeloma um, in general, and this would be the rough agenda that I will try and cover today. So first, uh, you know, what is the scale of the problem in Singapore? How common is it in Singapore? A bit about the natural history of myeloma, what happens, because many times patients come back and ask, you know, what's going to happen when they are newly diagnosed? Uh, they are still in a bit of a dark, uh, don't know what to expect in the years to come. So well, let's try and explore how, how the natural history of myeloma pans out. Uh, I have a very interesting uh, video, which uh, we can stop and start also, 
uh, about the complexity of myeloma, and that goes to the heart of many of the questions that patients ask me as well. This video was very nicely uh, you know, done by the UK-based cancer charity uh, in UK, where I used to work before. Uh, and that tries to you know, make you understand a bit more on the concepts of the genetic complexity and why relapses keep happening in myeloma. And a bit on the drugs and survival in Singapore, and uh, specifically, uh, you know, we go to the annual uh, American Society of Hematology meeting, and I'll talk a bit about what is new in the horizon and you know, how have the drugs, the newer drugs, helped. So this is uh, a curve. I apologize for the people who's sitting in the back, whether you can, if you can't see it properly. So this curve, um, I would like you to Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Okay, so if, if you follow um, these two uh, red circles here, this solid gray line, if you follow that, is the year 2000. And the one on the top is 2017. So myeloma is a disease of elderly, as we all know. And if you see, this is the population of people over 55 to 60. So in the year 2000, there were about 7% of the population who were over the age of 55 to 60. And if you see that in the top, uh, red circle, by 2017, that population has already reached the double that figure. It's about 14% of the population now. So that's one aspect. Second, these are the age standardized death rates across different countries, uh, developed countries in the West and here. And you can see Singapore is one that has significantly dropped the death rate from way back in the 1990s to around 2010. It's probably got one of the lowest death rates in the world. So these two put together makes a good chance for lots of older people to be among the mix in the population who are unfortunately the people where myeloma is going to strike. So going forward in the future, we're going to see unfortunately more and more uh, you know, myeloma patients. So how is it in Singapore? Um, as you probably all know, lymphoma is a tumor of lymphocytes, which is a type of white cells. And among them, B lymphocyte tumors are the most common ones, even in the East here. Um, and diffuse large B cell lymphoma is a type of B cell lymphoma that is the commonest type of lymphoma. And if you see next to it immediately, though myeloma is a tumor of plasma cells, plasma cell is the most developed form of B lymphocytes. And it's, it's second only to this most common type of lymphoma as a tumor among the B lymphocyte tumors. In Singapore, we know roughly, we have about 120 new patients of myeloma per year. That is the number of patients we deal with. Uh, on a, on a, in, these are new patients diagnosed every year. But of course, about 10, 15 years ago, the survival of a newly diagnosed myeloma patient was probably only about three to five years. Now the survival has gone up and it is closer to seven, eight years, and probably even longer for the uh, less um, severe myeloma patients where the genetic lesions are not so adverse. So that leaves us with an incidence of about 1.8 to 2 per 100,000 population against compared to some of the Western countries like US where it is much, much higher. It's about three to four fold higher. And we see that because of this um, population that is aging, as I showed you in the last slide, we expect about 5, 10 to 15 new patients on an increasing basis every year. Um, this term I will try and explain to you later. We often talk about progression-free survival and overall survival. Overall survival is uh, the length of time that a patient diagnosed with myeloma lives. And that is going you know, longer and longer. And hence, though there are only 100, 120 new patients per year, it accumulates. And over a period of time, you had so, more, so, much, so much more myeloma patients living. Uh, our median age in this part of the world with myeloma is 64 as compared to the West where it is a bit higher. And the, uh, the percentage of uh, different uh, ethnicities having myeloma is roughly mirroring the uh, ethnic, ethnicity distribution in the country. And uh, males having slightly more uh, commonly affected by myeloma than, uh, than the females. We all know that myeloma can affect patients um, organ systems in different ways, uh, the most common being kidney problems, 
uh, skeletal or bone lesions, high calcium level, um, and, and these distributions are roughly about one-fourth of our myeloma patients develop kidney problem. Uh, about nearly half of them have bone problem, and about 15% of them have high calcium in the blood. So that's to tell you a bit about the flavor of how the proportion of myeloma is and how the distribution of disease affects by the myeloma pans out in Singapore. Uh, this uh, no myeloma meeting that we go to uh, happens without showing this curve. And I tried to explain this a little bit. Now, over onto the left of this is what we call as MGUS or smoldering myeloma. So these are uh, patients, uh, and I probably wouldn't expect any of you guys to be in this stage because uh, this is a very uh, early form of myeloma, if you can put it that way. MGUS means that the abnormal protein that we talk about uh, in the clinics, every time you come, the protein is there in the blood, but these patients do not have any of the myeloma-associated problems. So they do not have kidney problem, they do not have any bone, uh, so-called holes in the bone, or they don't have anemia, they don't have any changes in the blood count. So all we can find out how this patient had this abnormal protein is by doing the blood test, and we find that the patients have this abnormal protein in the blood, that's all. So they are essentially normal. Smoldering myeloma is a little bit more than that. They uh, have a higher level of the protein, or may have subtle changes that suggest that they are getting towards being a myeloma patient. This is where most of the patients get diagnosed, uh, active myeloma. Now, what happens when we start treatment is the protein comes down, which kind of mirrors what is happening in the bone marrow. Obviously, the cancer cells or plas cancerous plasma cells are there in the bone marrow. That kind of mirrors what happens to the protein, and hence the disease is inactive at this stage. Now, this is what we call as progression-free survival. So this is the stage where the protein is at the lowest it can become uh, you know, with the treatment. And after a variable period of time, and that variable period of time is really variable between different patients having different treatments, the disease, the bugger doesn't go away. It comes back. And it does that again and again and again, till unfortunately we reach a stage where we have exhausted all treatments, right? So that's the, the, the last you know, right side end of the curve where it is refractory relapse. So uh, what people are trying to do is, and I wouldn't want to stress too much of this, this is going to be Prof Chung's talk next, whether, so there are a few things that people are trying to do, whether we catch hold of, try and catch hold of patients at this stage, whether it is worthwhile rather than getting patients at this stage where it, we know that this is not at a stage where it's going to get away completely and stay away, whether catching patients early at this stage where they're essentially normal and starting, starting treatment early here can make a difference and whether we can avoid this whole rut of going back and forth, back and forth with treatment, that is one aspect. Second is whether um, instituting different ways of treatment and, way, and approaches of treatment, whether, for example, maintenance treatment. So the aim is to keep this line like this as low as possible along the way without allowing these to happen. So that is the whole point of different treatment approaches, trying, for example, the maintenance treatment, you know, it's aimed at trying to keep the patients at this level. Every day we're exposed to millions of germs but our immune system keeps them at bay and protects us from infection and disease. White blood cells form an important part of the immune system. Different types work together to seek out and destroy germs that invade the body. Amongst them, the role of plasma cells is to produce antibodies that specifically tag themselves to that germ. Tag germs attract other white blood cells. Their role is to destroy and remove the germ. To recognize all possible types of germs, different plasma cells make different antibodies. By deliberately rearranging specific segments of their DNA, each plasma cell makes a unique set of antibodies that only targets one type of germ. Myeloma is a cancer of the plasma cells. Plasma cells can become cancerous when abnormalities occur in their genetic material. One example happens during the antibody-making process. 
when the DNA is being rearranged. Most have little effect, but some may cause the plasma cell to multiply out of control. Some abnormalities affect the structures in which DNA is packaged. These are called chromosomes. Each cell contains 46 chromosomes, arranged in pairs numbered from 1 to 23. In myeloma, chromosomes can be affected in a number of ways. Some involve the switching of genetic material between different pairs of chromosomes. For example, there may be an exchange between chromosome 11 and chromosome 14. This is known as the T1114 translocation. Others involve part of the chromosome breaking off. This is known as a deletion. Or they may gain an extra piece of chromosome. Some pairs even gain a whole chromosome. This is common in myeloma and is known as hyperdiploidy. Other abnormalities affect the DNA sequence of a gene, therefore altering the genetic instructions it carries. This type of abnormality is known as a point mutation and can happen during a person's lifetime or it can be inherited from our parents. Most point mutations are harmless and in fact many we inherit determine our individual characteristics, such as what colour eyes we have, or how tall or short we are. However, some genes we inherit may increase our risk of developing certain health problems, including cancer. Mutations we accumulate over our lifetime are more likely to cause myeloma, while those we inherit tend to increase the risk. Identifying the genetic abnormalities in each patient is useful because they can help predict the outcome of treatment. Yeah, that's one. White blood cell found in the bone marrow. Plasma cells play an important role in the immune system. They produce antibodies to fight the germs that cause infection and disease. Unlike other types of blood cells that come and go, plasma cells stay in the bone marrow for many years. Their job is to remember the germs that have previously invaded the body. Under normal conditions, plasma cells exist in a quiet state. But when a germ reinvades the body, the plasma cells become active and divide to form many copies or clones of themselves. These clones produce large amounts of the same antibody that recognize and remove the germ very quickly. Plasma cells therefore play an important role in generating immunity to infection and disease. Myeloma begins when the genetic material of a plasma cell is damaged but isn't repaired. Damage to genes controlling the cell cycling causes the plasma cell to multiply more quickly than normal. All of the new cells have the same genetic change as the original plasma cell and give rise to a population that are identical or monoclonal. Over time, one or more of the new cells may become even more damaged and as these multiply, different populations or subclones of abnormal plasma cells develop. Myeloma is therefore not a single cancer but a collection of different types of the same cancer. Subclones compete for resources within the bone marrow, and some even depend on each other for survival. In the right environment, the clones that survive go on to thrive and allow the myeloma to progress and persist. Treatment destroys some of the subclones, but others may have a survival advantage that helps make them resistant to treatment. Remaining subclones may be dormant for a time and provide a period of remission. However, they will at some point become active again if they incur further genetic damage or if the environment changes in a way that favours their growth. This is the reason why relapse occurs. With successive lines of treatment, the toughest clones are naturally selected for survival. Those that remain are the ones that are resistant to treatment. Understanding how a patient's myeloma evolves throughout its course will help determine the best treatment for them at that time. I think you can stop that, thank you. Uh, I hope a lot of that video made sense. If not, we can uh, go through it um, later again. Uh, so this is just to give you a timeline of how the 
uh, myeloma drugs have been. So up until um, 1990s, not much was going on other than the discovery about uh, the effectiveness of autologous stem cell transplant, where you transplant patients' own stem cells back into them after a high dose of melphalan chemotherapy. But with the advent of these newer drugs that most of you will now be familiar about, uh, thalidomide, bortezomib, which is Velcade, uh, lenalidomide or Revlimid, uh, you know, things really started to improve. And I shall show in the subsequent slide, you know, if you see this, this curve, uh, the red or maroon color, was way back in 1965. And if you see roughly about at the end of three years, nearly 70 to 80 percent of the myeloma patients have already passed on. Whereas if you follow the curve, the solid light blue curve here, which is the most, uh, which is a bit more recent, 2005 to 10, you can see at the same time point of three years, nearly 75 to 80 percent of the myeloma patients are still alive. Uh, so that, that is almost flipped from about 70% of the patients dying to about 70% of the patients living now is a, is a remarkable change. But it has taken us a better part of 40, 45 years to get there. And that is, uh, you know, no, no doubt without these, uh, you know, effective treatments would not have been possible. Uh, so what is happening in Singapore? In, in, in Singapore itself, this, this data shows, this is including, uh, you know, across the board, across different hospitals in uh, Singapore. This solid um, uh, blue line is the patients who have had uh, autologous stem cell transplant, uh, irrespective of whatever treatment they received beforehand. And this red line is the ones, um, patients who did not have a transplant. And as you can see, uh, 100 months is uh, about, what, eight years? Um, you know, the, the percentage of patients who had a transplant, uh, about 60% 60, 60 of them are still alive and well, whereas at the same time point, only about 25% of the patients who did not have transplant uh, were, were there. So this, this suggests that obviously transplant in our context is also, uh, you know, extremely effective form of treatment. This just gives you an overview of different treatments. So we call uh, Velcade and that group of drugs, which are italicized, uh, sorry, which are colored here, as OMIPs, so these are you know proteasome inhibitors. They work by affecting a pathway, a specific pathway within a cell, um, which which deals with we can call it as a garbage disposal system. So the proteins are de degraded by this garbage disposal system, which these drugs block, and hence the the proteins that are necessary for survival uh, are uh, inhibited um, by uh, the availability of things that inhibit them, and hence, it's, it's a bit complex to understand, but basically they, they make the myeloma cells die. With the immunomodulatory drugs, the philosophy of treatment is a bit different. They um, work on your immune system and, and make them, uh, you know, more um, uh, controlling, the, able to control the myeloma cells within your body. The antibodies are a more recent uh, kind of entry into the armamentarium of treatment. They go and attack. They work in different ways, but the very simple uh, way to put it is they go and attack a protein that is on the surface of these cancerous plasma cells and thereby destroying them. And uh, you'd be delighted to know that there are more and more classes of uh, drugs that are coming up. Not only are uh, newer drugs within the same class are being developed, but we are coming up also with newer um, you know, drugs of different classes that work by different mechanisms because of the work of the myeloma you know, scientific community. Uh, so what's new in myeloma? So we go annually to the annual uh, you know, uh, American Society of Hematology meetings and we try and um, you know, learn something new that we can apply here locally. Uh, many times it is you know, combining uh, several uh, new drugs that may not be possible in our context because of cost and other reasons, but sometimes we do time to time come across simple concepts that perhaps we can adopt here. Uh, I'll uh, not dwell too much into the first um, uh, aspect of this, which was uh, you know, increasingly uh, being talked more and more, uh, as Prof Chung is going to have an entire session on that. Uh, I will stress a couple of things about what we call as MRD or minimal residual disease, as well as whether you know, adding more drugs to the mix is uh, going to get us to uh, better survival rates and so on. And uh, there is increasingly a concept of individualized treatment, which I'll come to, and then uh, a word or two about the newer treatment uh, approaches. 
So we'll uh, go into the minimal risk of disease. Now, uh, at the time of diagnosis, if you see here, roughly most of the patients have 10 to the power 12 cells of myeloma within them. So if you have to put it in the context of numbers, it is about a million times million. So that's the number of cells we have in a newly diagnosed myeloma patient. Now, uh, you'll all realize that when we talk about the response, we use the term remission or response, partial response. So that is when your say your di diagnosis, your myeloma protein or paraprotein or um, you know, M band as we call it, was say 40 at diagnosis. And after having a certain number of courses of treatment, your protein has come from 40 to 20. That is about what we call as partial remission. So you, you can understand that even at that point, there are so many you know, issues, uh, perhaps you've had side effects with treatment, but at best, we only achieved a 50% reduction in your M protein. So if you can see here, see here, then the numbers here is come from 10 power 12 at diagnosis to probably about 10 power 10. So we still have more than a billion myeloma cells left inside patients who have achieved a partial remission. And if you stretch that further, if you reach a stage of what we call as complete remission, where we cannot find your myeloma protein anymore in your blood with using standard tests, an even more deep remission, we call it a stringent complete remission, where your, even your light chain tests are normal. If you do your bone marrow tests, we cannot find with routine testing any abnormal plasma cells left. You still have got more than 100 million cells left uh, of myeloma in that. It's just that with the best uh, you know, current standard tests, we cannot find that myeloma cells in your body. That doesn't mean that they are, the cells are not there. So the next level is what we call as minimal residual disease. So this is using specialized tests uh, that we now have available in Singapore uh, called flow cytometry, where at about using those tests, we know that there is about 10 power 5 to 10 power 6, so about 100,000 to 1 million cells that are you know, probably left. And even that, achieving that stage uh, is, is, is uh, a lot meaningful compared to just getting to a complete remission. And I'll sh go on to show how um, this has uh, you know, come out in trial. So this is one, stu one such study that was done in France. And if you see, these curves represent survival of different group of patients. So if you see, pay attention just to the blue and the solid red curve there. So these are patients who were MRD negative. So when, we did, when they did the MRD test that I was just mentioning about, they couldn't find, um, you know, they could, con they could say clearly that they have less than 10 power 5 to 10 power 6 cells at that stage. And these two uh, you know, arms of treatment um, could be either they received a combination of the bortezomib and revlimid treatment and an autologous transplant, or they received only the bortezomib and revlimid treatment without the transplant. So, but whatever treatment they received, they get, got to a stage where their MRD test was negative. So they clearly did better compared to those, whether or not they had transplant, their MRD test was positive. So it clearly shows that it, probably drives home the message that it doesn't matter so much as to what treatment you have, as long as you get to the stage where your MRD test is negative, you do better than if the disease stays on still uh, with your MRD test being positive. So that kind of makes logistic sense. If you still have a lot of disease that is measurable, you don't do as well. Uh, this just uh, reflects that in the scheme of overall survival. So the patients in red curve here um, you know, overall, at the end of four years, they obviously, if they're MRD negative, they did much better than if their MRD testing was positive. Um, so what do we, uh, how do we apply that in the Singapore context? So this was a study that was started by Dr. Satish, called SGHMM1, which NUH and other centers also participated. We, in a smaller scale in a, in a country like ours, we, um, you know, wanted to pick out specific population of patients with myeloma who had a higher cytogenetic risk and then applied a specific treatment. Uh, and many of you, I, I can see, had participated in the trial, and thank you very much for that. Um, they, they received carfilzomib, um, cyclophosphamide, and DEX, which is one uh, you know, triplet treatment. And at the end of it, um, we found that certain patients were positive uh, for the MRD testing, and certain patients were negative. So when in, the, in, the, in this trial protocol, patients who were MRD positive after the whole, whole uh, treatment went on to have maintenance treatment with carfilzomib, whereas the ones who did not have MRD uh, at the end of this treatment after transplant did not receive it. And we have some early results uh, of this, which we have you know, submitted to one of the meetings. Here you can see that uh, for a patient population which had high risk of myeloma, 
when, we follow, when average follow, uh, follow up has been about one and a half years for them, most patients, uh, you know, progression free survival um, was about 28 months, which is, what, which is not too bad and is comparable to most of the Western studies. And um, this is the overall survival for those patients, which, um, you know, which is also quite comparable to the studies that we know with this drug have happened elsewhere. And coming to the MRD point, we find this is interesting, although you know, the caveat here is there's very, very small numbers. So we, we have to be careful about drawing any conclusions here, but maybe this, I do not know if this indicates, this is the blue curve is the patients who were MRD negative, and the dotted um, broken red line is the ones who were MRD positive. So perhaps uh, this might suggest that maybe uh, the carfilzomib kind of obviates the difference between your test being positive versus negative, but again, it's, it's very small numbers and we have to you know, wait for longer follow-up and uh, see if this pans out really as, as it turns out to be. So uh, again, uh, we, about five, seven, eight years ago, we found out that rather than using two combination of drugs, like example, Velcade, dexamethasone, or you know, similar combinations, we add three drugs to the mix, three drugs is better than two, and that has compared almost across the board, using three drugs is better than two. So now increasingly they are you know, suggesting that maybe four drugs is better than three. Uh, I don't know how this is going to, you know, uh, where this is going to end. We cannot keep on increasing the number of drugs because obviously you are going to increase toxicity. But this is just one example of how they did it. Again, it's it's a, almost like a proof of concept study, um, and and this is extremely expensive combination. This, you know, this is what I will call as a million dollar regime, and it's certainly it's not extrapolatable to to Singapore. But what is interesting is they they managed to show that if you use very effective combinations. What, was, what used to be the complete response rates in the order of you know, 20, 30 percent, they're able to almost double it by adding on the drugs. And at the end of the day, you know, they, they, they will argue that combining more effective drugs, even though it's four drugs, it is possible. You know, they, they did show that, that it's not like patients get so much toxicity that they die when they receive this combination or anything like that. Uh, and similarly, this is just uh, you know, combining um, different combination of four drugs versus three drugs, and again showed that patients who received four drugs lived, uh, you know, uh, had a better survival than um, patients who had three drugs. The other, uh, you know, interesting, uh, you know, concept that is coming across cancer, not just myeloma, is the use of individualized treatment, and this um, means that, you know, in the video you saw patients with different genetic abnormalities in myeloma. One such abnormality is um, a chromosome translocation that was shown in the video of 1114. So a bit of chromosome 11 gets mixed up with a bit of chromosome 14, and you get something called T translocation 1114 myeloma. And what was found was when they were screening for these for the for the drugs, this this particular drug called venetoclax, which affects a different pathway, none of the pathways that I've shown you for myeloma drugs uh, you know, affect the same pathway as venetoclax, they found that this particular drug worked you know, quite well for this particular subtype of myeloma. So it is evolving over a period of time that maybe all myeloma should not be treated like the same. You don't get the same drug combinations, but maybe this is a beginning of uh, an era where we will hopefully see specific drugs developed for specific myeloma patients. Uh, it's, it's, you know, probably going to take years of work to get there, but at least this is a, a concept that kind of appeals to the scientific community. Um, this is again, uh, you know, laboring the point, but I, I probably wouldn't stress too much. This is uh, using another protein on the surface of these myeloma patients. So uh, what is newer? So again, uh, it was delighting to see there was, you know, the different new drugs that were coming. Venetoclax that I mentioned in the, in the previous slide. There were other new drugs, new antibodies, and new approaches to treatment. Uh, I was, uh, you know, uh, pleased to be asked about, uh, you know, CAR T cell therapy from some of the patients. So this is a novel concept where you harvest patients' own uh, type of white cells and then genetically engineer them against, to work against myeloma cells, and then you put them back into patients um, so that they go and attack the tumor cells. So that is one form of uh, new therapy. It is, it is being, you know, piloted around the world, and uh, I'm sure we'll get this in Singapore within the next year or two. Uh, similarly, uh, there are other antibodies where they bring closer. So the tumors are, you know, always getting cleverer, trying to get over the treatment that we are giving them, and hence, what this bite antibody treatment does is trying to bring the cancerous um, cell, in this case, the cancerous plasma cell, together with the white cell, which is tried to escape from 
combine them together so that allow the immunity to kind of run riot on the cancer cells and that way, uh, you know, get control of the cancer. Uh, and, and lastly, I cannot stress more uh, that we are in a better place um, in, in Singapore because we have the you know, cooperation of all the regional countries under the auspices of uh, the International Myeloma Foundation, which uh, provides us and gives us a platform not for just providing clinical trials and thereby increasing a huge, uh, in a huge way the access to novel treatments, which otherwise our patients may or may not be able to afford. And, and uh, this was uh, you know, all of us in a first ever Asian Myeloma Network Summit last year. Uh, and you know, it's through platforms like this that we will be able to improve the care for our patients. Um, so it is, it, is, it is good to be part of such regional collaboration networks. And I think that's the last slide, and you can see Dr. Professor Cheng smiling away there with his youthful face. <laughs> I probably should ask, what is the secret of your youth? <laughs> uh, and I think that's my last slide. And thank you very much for your attention. Prof. Cheng will, is the next speaker. He will speak to us on the need for treatment on M proteins. Thank you, Prof. Cheng. Okay, great. That was an excellent uh, presentation by um, Dr. Maoli there that hopefully set the stage um, and, and provide very useful. I thought the videos were, were very kind of nice as well because it showed very graphically some of these very complicated concepts that we try to explain in the clinic. Um, you know, not very successfully usually because they're quite complicated. I thought that was uh, useful. I think I want to address this issue that um, very often the patients come to clinic and they ask. Both those patients that um, come in where they were found through usually screening, you know, nowadays, which is a good thing, I mean, people go and have regular screening blood tests, and sometimes the GP are quite vigilant. They find out that you know, the protein level is increased, and then they do further testing, and it's found that you have this monoclonal protein or M protein uh, that is detected in the blood. Um, and, and so they will refer you to a specialist, right? So, so that's one category of patients that come in, they're completely well, you know, and to them it's a shock. It's like, whoa, whoa you know, what's going on with this abnormal results? I'm very worried. Uh, and then the question is, do we need to start treatment? Right? Uh, someone is telling me I've got abnormal protein, abnormal cells in me, do I need to start treatment? Then the other big group of patients are those that actually have a diagnosis of myeloma. Uh, they have undergone treatment, okay, and the treatment has made them feel better. They're feeling back to normal. You know, they are wanting to go back to work, you know, they're going back to doing their sports and whatever as per usual. But then the, the M protein either uh, cannot completely disappear Okay, so there's a bit left, uh, or it has disappeared, so gone, the patient has gone into a remission, but after a while, it's kind of reappeared a bit again, you know, at low levels, right? So then the big question here is that, oh, do I need to start treatment again? When do I need to start treatment? Why am I not having treatment? The worst thing is, not the worst thing, but sometimes in the patient uh, discussion, you know, there's always comparison. Hey, how come you're on treatment and I'm not? I'm having this M protein. You know, so, you know, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of concern naturally, right? So I thought I'll address uh, this issue uh, and, and hopefully later on we can have a discussion as well to try to uh, clarify some of these uh, points, right? The first thing to say is that M proteins are very common as you get older in normal population, okay? Um, it goes from 3 to 4% of everyone above 50 to 5% if you're above 65 to 10% if you're above 85, right? So 10% of people above 85 who don't have myeloma or any plasma cell related problem may have a, 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 a M protein that is present. And in fact, in a study, this is quite old now from the Mayo Clinic of more than 1,000 patients, they found that the causes of M, presence of M protein, only 18% is due to myeloma. You know, the rest are due to, you know, other kind of conditions, right? Including lymphoma, um, as well as, you know, some rare types of lymphoma like Waldenstrom's, amyloidosis. You know, these are also constituting about 17, 18%, about the same as myeloma. And then the big, huge number of these are what we call MGUS, 
or the monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, or those old people that have M-protein but it's completely well, no symptoms, right? So the definition of this is you have M-protein but you have no symptoms and this M-protein is of small amount. Or you have smoldering myeloma, which is now a higher level of M-protein, but still the patients don't have any symptoms. Okay, So the question is, are these MGAS patient, are these smoldering myeloma patient, what are they? What are they? How do they behave? Do we need to treat them? Okay. So first thing to say is that we have some criteria to classify the patients into these categories. Monoclonal, gammopathy of uncertain significance or undetermined significance, MGAS, smoldering myeloma, and symptomatic myeloma. These patients need treatment, no questions. Okay? They, they have symptoms. And what are these symptoms? These are the crab symptoms we call crab. You know, easy for Singaporeans to remember. We like our chili crab, uh, pepper crab, and all those. Crab stands for um, high calcium, that's a C. R is the renal impairment high creatinine, A is the anemia, um, and B is the bone disease. So if you have any one of these symptoms, right, together with the M protein, you have myeloma, you need treatment. So these guys don't have any symptoms or what we call end organ damage, nothing at all, and they feel fine. But they have M protein, right? And depending on whether the M protein is above or below this magic mark of 30 gram per liter, you're either M gas or myeloma. And then also they look at the bone marrow, plasma cell percentage. So if you have low, less than 10%, you are MGAS. Okay, so we have a, a way to classify these things. Okay, and why is it important to classify them? Because if you look at this MGAS, right, and this has been a, a very painstaking study, you know, looking at patients over 25 years uh, in Minnesota County where, you know, it's uh, governed or, or um, covered by the Mayo Clinic. So this is uh, Robert Carl's uh, lifetime's work. They see that the patients that have MGUS, the progression to myeloma is really a, almost like a straight line, you know, and it's like 1% per year, okay? So your risk, uh, the first year you have myeloma is only 1%. The second year you have, sorry, the first year you have MGAS is 1%. Second year you have MGAS is 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%. You know, so if you... Um, live 100 years with MGAS, you will have 100% chance of developing myeloma. But who lives for 100 years with MGAS, right? Because you're probably diagnosed with MGAS in your 50s or 60s. So that is impossible, right? So, but the progression is really very low risk, very little, right? So these patients do not need treatment because if you treat them, it doesn't really help them because they may not develop myeloma in the first place. And the chances is they will not because the risk of developing myeloma is very low. So what these people need is follow-up, right? So uh, they need to be followed, you know, uh, initially maybe every six months, and if they are stable, they can follow uh, over a longer period of time. And if they develop new symptoms, like if they become anemic or whatever, re-evaluate again whether these symptoms are due to the plasma cell or something else because there could be some other reasons for some of these things like kidney problem and so on, right? So these patients don't need treatment, okay? So if you have an M protein and your doctor tell you that, oh, actually you've got M gas, you don't need treatment. You, but you do need monitoring. You need follow-up, okay? So that's the thing about patients with uh, M protein is that they do need to go back to your specialist on a regular basis for follow-up because we must monitor and see whether... Uh, your M protein will increase and then you develop symptoms or not. So you cannot stop going back to the doctors. But the follow-up frequency do not need to be very high. It's not like you need to go back every month or every two months. It could be much longer than that. Okay. And then if you have a higher risk MGAS, so there are ways to look at it using some of the blood parameters, um, then you know we may need a closer follow-up, right? Closer follow-up, uh, you know, rather than two, three years uh, annually, right, for life. Okay, so it's just how much follow-up you need. And if there are other uh, suspicious things, like if you've got some uh, other symptoms like lymph node or lymph gland swelling, then we need to look for uh, lymphoma, okay? Other causes of abnormal M protein, okay? So it's quite clear that for MGAS, you don't need uh, any uh, kind of uh, treatment, but you need follow-up. And the frequency of follow-up 
depends on the risk that is based on some blood parameters or blood tests that your doctors will do for you. The other category, if you remember, next step up is called the smoldering myeloma, right? Smoldering myeloma, where the M protein is higher or the plasma cells in the bone marrow is higher percentage, but you still don't have symptoms, perfectly okay, right? Now, this one, again, uh, Bob Cowles work uh, over 25 years in Minnesota looking at these patients. The risk now is quite different, huh? you realize? This is MGAS, it's like at this kind of rate, very flat, very low. The smoldering, chances of progression is much higher now. And there are this group here that progress very fast, right, to myeloma. In, within five years, there's 10% of these that will progress. But those that don't progress within this time, it becomes flatter and flatter. And there's a large group here that behave almost exactly like your MGAS. So the key thing now is, can we identify this group of patients? Better still, can we identify those that are here that progress within you know, one or two years? Because these patients may be the ones that we need to treat earlier before they develop symptoms. And it's worthwhile treating these patients because they are almost certainly going to be developing myeloma within one or two years. right? So this is the, the group that we are looking at that potentially we may need treatment. So how do we identify this group? You know, is there some ways for us to identify this group of patients that may require treatment earlier? And luckily the answer is yes, through many groups' uh, excellent work, they identify some important parameters through the studies of these patients. So here is a study where clearly if you have a bone marrow plasma cell percentage of more than or equals to 60%, that means when we do a bone marrow and we look under the microscope, there's more than 60% plasma cells inside the bone marrow, your risk of progression to myeloma is almost 90% or more within the two years. And in fact, half, 50% of those patients would have progressed uh, within one year. Okay, so this is a very high-risk group. So that's one parameter. Compared to those that have less than 60%, these guys are doing a lot better and their progression you know, hasn't been reached in the median or maybe it's about 10 years. So this group may not need early treatment, but this group need. The other one is a free light chain ratio uh, of 100. Okay, and you can see here, these groups progress much faster uh, at a median of 15 months, so again, within two years. So those are the group of patients that we want to target. Within two years, they get progression. So this is another criteria, free light chain ratio. Okay, and then this group from Greece, nicely look at all these parameters and again, identify this two parameter, free light chain ratio and bone marrow infiltration as important. And they even show that if you have both this together, your progression is only eight months. So very, very high risk, okay? So these are the parameters that we can use. And the third is that if you have smoldering myeloma and you did an MRI whole body and we are able to detect more than one focal lesion, one or more focal lesion in, on your MRI scan in your bone, your risk of progression is only about a year. So again, uh, able to identify a very high risk group of patients. Okay, so using the bone marrow plasma cell percentage, the free light chain ratio, and the MRI of your bone, these three parameters, we can identify a high risk group of smoldering myeloma patient where the time to progression to symptomatic myeloma, to develop symptoms, is only uh, within two years. And these are what people today call early myeloma. So these are perhaps the group of patients that need early treatment, okay? Or that early treatment may benefit them. Uh, yeah, so that's the group. And then you have the low-risk ones, which are more like your MGUS. Look at these guys, hardly any change at all in terms of progression, almost a flat line, that you can monitor them like your MGUS patient. You know, once every six months, and then after that, once every year or once every two years, right? And then there's this group of standard risk that is in the middle that perhaps need closer follow-up because they may progress 
after five years, after six years, and you need closer follow-up. Then the question is that, okay, good, you can identify these new early myeloma patients, right? High risk for progression. Do they really need earlier treatment? Because does it benefit the patient? Let's give them maybe two years time. If they develop the symptoms, we treat them just like how we treat myeloma. Um, they get two years off treatment and um, they may have less symptoms from the side effects of the drug. Uh, and who knows, they may progress after two years because that's also just an average. It's not 100% of patients progress uh, within two years, right? So do they benefit from earlier treatment? Now we get a sense that they do potentially benefit from earlier treatment from this study that was published in New England a few years ago already. There are now many, many uh, trials that are testing early treatment in this group of patients to see whether they benefit. And I think in the next one or two years, you know, a lot more information will become available to tell us whether early treatment definitely helps patient or not, and also what type of drugs would be most useful for early treatments. So this trial, they use lenalidomide. I think this should be very familiar with many of you. Many of you may have uh, treatment with lenalidomide before. The reason why they use this drug first is because it is an oral medication. It's quite convenient uh, for patient to take. And also at that time, this is probably one of the better oral medication that we have. Um, so they wanted to test this in this trial. And so this is the design. They test this drug together with dexamethasone for nine cycles, followed by just lenalidomide maintenance alone, compared to the, the other arm, the so-called control arm, which is no treatment. Because at that time, the standard is not to give treatment, right? So they are comparing against a standard clinical practice. And I think when the trial started, many people would think that ah, surely you, yes, when you have treatment, you will delay the time to progression. That's only logical and natural, right? So if we see that, it wouldn't be surprising. But people have suspected that it won't change the overall survival. You know, so whether you treat early or you treat them later when they develop symptoms, the overall survival may not change you know, if it's not beneficial. And most people think that it will not change. But the surprising thing is that you can see clearly here that the lenalidomide um, dexamethasone patients have much uh, longer uh, survival. Um, and so it would appear that early treatment, at least in this one trial, with lenalidomide and dexamethasone benefit patient with high-risk smoldering myeloma disease. That's one piece of evidence we have to, I mean, you know, if you're a bit more conservative, you would want to wait for another one or two trials to confirm this concept. But if you are a very kind of aggressive type individual, you want to go for, you know, the, the best possible treatment, uh, even if there is some small chance that it is true, then you would say, I want treatment when I have high-risk disease. So I think on me, I, I usually talk to patients and see what's their appetite for treatment versus toxicity versus benefit is before we decide. Because there's one evidence. Uh, if there's more, then it becomes standard. Then I will say that we probably should treat early. But if it's one, you know, we can have a discussion knowing what the appetite is. But as a result of that, now you can see, right? So if you have smoldering myeloma, no symptoms, but you have more than 10% or more than 30 gram, this is smoldering myeloma, we will look at three other parameters. Is the plasma cell percentage more than 60%? Is the free light chain ratio more than 100? Is the uh, MRI more than one focal lesion? If it's yes, it becomes what we call now today active myeloma and we, will, we should treat. In my case, as I said, I'll have a discussion with the patient. Um, if you are no, then it's smoldering, then you observe. And if you have MGAS, you observe as well, right? So this answers the question, what happens if I have M protein and I'm well? After I go to my GP for a screening test, this is what they tell me. I am, I've got M protein, I need to go and see a blood specialist, but I feel well, I have nothing. So do I need treatment? This is telling us what to do. Okay, so if you have smoldering, you have MGAS, no need treatment at all. It's very safe. If you have smoldering, you uh, look at these criteria. If they do have these criteria, 
you should consider treatment, but you can also wait a bit and see what's happening with the M protein because very often we get only one single reading at the beginning, right? Uh, that patient could well have that reading for three, four years before that. We don't know. It's just that he never go for screening before, right? Or the GP never pick it up. So you must imagine that these things doesn't just appear overnight. It's not like today I wake up, suddenly you got M protein. They take time to build up, right? So sometimes it may be also sensible if you're completely well to just get a few other readings over the next couple of months to see whether this thing changes at all or they remain stable. Okay, and certainly in recent uh, months and weeks, I've had a few patients that's like that. We have monitored. There are some patients that remain no problem uh, and they have remained no problem for a number of years. But there are other patients that uh, within six months, it's quite clear that they are progressing and we have to start treatment earlier. So the tempo of the progression is also an important factor. It's this pattern, okay? So then the other group is, what happens if my M-band reappear or start to rise after I finish my treatment? You know, I'm so happy now, I finished my transplant and all those things. The doctor tell me everything is clear, you know, I'm going back to doing my routine. And then, you know, one year later, at one of the clinic appointments, they tell me that it's come back again, you know, so do I need to start treatment? Um, and again, this uh, is, and, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's highly variable. It depends on many, many parameters, which I'll explain a bit later. Um, but first of all, what is uh, uh, constituting a progression is that very often when you just have a, if your after treatment, your M band disappear, right? So the doctor tells you everything disappeared. There's no more protein. There's no more band. Uh, if it then later on, the band just reappear, but still they cannot measure the protein or the protein is very low. It doesn't really constitute a progression yet. There needs to be some criteria, there must be a 25% increase in the protein or the light chain on two consecutive occasions compared to your lowest point. But there also need to be an absolute increase by 5 gram per litre or light chain by 100 uh, gram per litre. So there need to be some real increase, not just some little you know, reappearance. All right? And then there are two scenarios that you can see in the relapse setting clinically. right? One is what we call a slow asymptomatic relapse or sometimes we call a biochemical relapse because the only relapse is seen in the blood test. Okay, the patient really doesn't have anything. Okay, they don't have any symptoms. Uh, the rise in the M band is very, very slow and I'll show you some example of that. The tumour burden is low. You know, uh, there is no plasmacytoma that's growing out of them. Uh, there's hardly any kind of bone disease. Um, the patients may have low-risk disease, as explained by uh, Dr. Mauli before, based on the genetics and stuff. Okay? So even at the beginning, they were low-risk uh, disease. They responded very easily and very well to treatment. So these are the uh, good type of patients. And then they have good performance status. You know, they're fit. They don't have many um, organs that are already affected by the myeloma. When they presented, they didn't have renal failure or vertebral collapse you know, that causes cord compression. You know, so they presented maybe with just some anemia, fatigue and so on. So they have overall, um, the presentation was good and the performance status, they are fit and well. Okay? So these patients, we can afford to observe a bit and see again what is the tempo of this rise in the M protein. Okay? And sometimes they can take a long time. And even when they rise, they can stop and then it remains like that for a long time. Okay, and I'll show you some example uh, later. The other clear scenario is the fast symptomatic re relapse. You know, they, they come in, uh, straight away they have symptoms already. The, you can see the blood count is falling. You know, the creatinine is going up, suggesting the kidney is affected, right? Uh, the M-band rise two times. Every month you see them, they go from two to four to eight to, you know, 16 every month, right? It's very fast. Um, uh, they may present with extramedullary disease or initially when they presented, they have a lot of bad symptoms, right? They needed dialysis, they have transfusion requirements, they have plasma cytoma. So it's a very aggressive type of presentation. Then you need to act a bit faster, you know, organ involvement. They have high-risk disease and they're already poor performance status, meaning that they may be a bit more elderly, they may be uh, having other uh, issues, medical problem. Then these guys need very prompt treatment. Of course, as always, there are also a big group that is in between. They could be asymptomatic, but they have 
uh, organ involvement, high-risk disease, when uh, they started, these patients, again, you want to monitor, even if you don't want to start treatment straight away, you want to monitor them very closely and at any signs that there is increase in the M-band, upward trend, you may want to treat them before they develop symptoms as well. Right? So there is three categories really. This one, don't wait, start straight away. This one, you can monitor for longer. And then in the middle, um, closer monitoring and start treatment early if any signs of progression before they develop symptoms. Okay, so that is what um, I will usually do and I'll recommend to the patient. So I will show you three examples of uh, patients that I've um, seen in clinic. You know? um, so this is a patient uh, uh, who has myeloma that was treated here um, and uh, did very well. You notice that the patient is not in complete remission. Huh? Even when we say very well, he still has about 3 gram per liter of monoclonal protein. Thing to say is not every patient is able to go down to zero. Okay, not every patient is able to go down to zero. These patients, after we have had transplant and all, all the other treatment, went down to this level. Okay, and uh, we decided to uh, stop the treatment because he had side effects, toxicity from the ongoing maintenance and so on, so we stopped there. And we monitor the patient. So after stopping, you realize that, yes, the M protein has gone up a bit. The time frame here, this is um, in the order of every two months. Uh, and, and here, because it's going up, I say we monitor you closely once a month. But you can see that the rise you know, is not very fast. This is 6.2, 6.5, 6.7. So it's, it's very little change. And it also fluctuates, right? So if you draw an average it's actually probably around here at this stage over a period of uh, six months, right? And the good thing is the patient's completely asymptomatic. He's back at work. He doesn't have any problem with uh, anemia. Creatinine was okay. Calcium level was okay and all those things. And we continue to watch him, right? And then you can see that over time, and this is over a period of three years, it's, con it's kind of gradually went up to now 14. You would say that it's gone up how many? seven times compared to its lowest point, okay? But its lowest point, you know, um, is not zero. La. So, so this is 2.9 up to, up to now, three years. He still remains well, completely asymptomatic, uh, you know, off treatment um, and, and pretty happy. So I am telling you these alternative that there are patients that you can monitor. He has low risk disease when he started. Um, there's no major organ involvement. Uh, he's relatively fit still, um, and this is him. I can tell you that at some point, if these things continue to go up, he will develop some symptoms. At some point along this trajectory, we may well need to start treatment. But if I had started treatment here, I would have given him three more years of treatment when he may not have needed, three more years of potential side effects from drugs, and three more years of cost of treatment, you know. Um, so this is just to say that we need to look at not just the M protein itself, we need to look at the whole package, including the blood count, the creatinine, the tempo, the patient's presentation, the disease. So work with your physicians uh, in kind of identifying the right uh, approach. We also have another patient here that, uh, again, have myeloma, was treated very nicely, went on to... Uh, 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 clinical trial after the, the transplant for maintenance uh, treatment um, and it worked for a while but then you know um, it started to come up at some point here the patients officially based on criteria considered to have progression so have to stop the trial so no more drugs right no more drugs but he was getting you know again a, a bit of side effects from the drugs you know and he was kind of thankful to have this drug free holiday, he said, fine, stop the drug and let's see what happens. He didn't want to change treatment uh, to another treatment straight away because it was, he was having some side effects from the treatment, right? So we can see here, uh, he continued to progress, right? I mean, the, the, the reading continued to creep up. This is a light chain uh, uh, reading. Creep up and then here there's a little jump here. But throughout this time, he was completely, again, asymptomatic. His blood count is normal, kidney normal, calcium normal no bone pain at all, becoming more active. Actually, he was quite thankful not to be on treatment uh, and having a treatment-free period. Um, so for this patient, I will continue to 
not give him treatment, just to monitor him over a long period of time, see what is happening with this trend. Is it going up more like that now or it will stabilize and become more like that, right? Uh, before we decide. You know, so sometimes it's not necessary to jump in. Patients can do pretty well still uh, when they have so-called progression. Uh, this is another patient. You know, the reading is very high now, right? This patient's reading is like 30-something, you know, M-band 38, highest at some point. Uh, he was, again, a patient who um, uh, was, was on a trial. Uh, after a transplant, went on to a maintenance study, was on a maintenance for uh, a period of time and then progressed uh, on that. Um, and uh, I think this is the point where he progressed. So this is the baseline uh, at the point that he stopped treatment. Um, I look at this level and I said that, well, maybe you should consider going on to another treatment because it looks a bit high. Because one of the common questions is patients ask, how high would you go before you start treatment, right? So the level itself may not be the absolute requirement as well. So, but he again, you know, sometimes the patient, what patient one, you know, is valuable because he said that, well, you know, I, I feel perfectly fine, right? And um, I, you know, was having, again, some side effects on, on these treatment that I had before. I would, again, rather not have treatment. Can we monitor and see? So I said, that's fine, let's monitor closely. Uh, and because he was on a, uh, a trial follow-up, even though he stopped the drug, we are seeing him every month. Okay, I say, then let's monitor. So he's been coming back every month uh, for follow-up uh, since stopping the trial drug, but he's still on uh, survival follow-up for the trial. You can see that, first of all, it didn't change much for a number of months. Then it had a bit of a jump. This is 29 compared to 25. Okay, so this jump is about 18%, okay, uh, up from this level. And then it fluctuates, and then it went up, and then it fluctuates around some sort of baseline, then it went up a bit as well. So now it's 38, okay? It may seem quite high, but the patient continued to be well, full blood count normal, creatinine normal, uh, and, and so on. So I'm just trying to paint a picture that when you have an emergence of M protein uh, or a rising M protein, it doesn't always mean that I have to start treatment. Of course, the patient have a choice. If you are uncomfortable with that, you know, we, we can treat you, that's not a problem. But not everyone need treatment straight away. And I usually would like to monitor things for a period of time, particularly if they have low risk disease, uh, they come from a background where their presentation was nothing serious, no organ damage, um, their blood count remains completely normal and we can monitor and look at whether there's any emergence of symptoms. And sometimes you don't want, need to wait until the symptoms emerge because you can look at the trend of the creatinine as well. If the creatinine is creeping up, although it may still be in the normal level, it may be a sign that something is happening. If the hemoglobin for the patient is normally 13 and it's coming out to 12, coming down to 11, these are still fairly normal levels but you know that something is happening, then you can start treatment earlier. But if they remain flat, 13, 14, very robust for hemoglobin, creatinine is completely normal, and everything else is normal, and the, the, the kind of tempo of these changes are not kind of going straight up like that, you know, um, but it's more like this, and it's pretty flat, we can sometimes monitor the patients. But the key thing is the patients need to be monitored. So the patients cannot think that, oh, I don't need treatment, great, I'm not going to come back. You know, they need to be monitored because at some point, they truly uh, will need treatment, right? So I think in conclusion, treatment is not always necessary with the presence of M protein as we saw at the beginning. MGAS doesn't need, just need follow-up. Smoldering, again, if they don't have high risk, don't need early treatment. If they have high risk, there are data that suggest early treatment may benefit, but that's one trial. I'm usually having a discussion with the patients to see their appetite for treatment versus side effects versus uh, you know, benefit. And then uh, if they have relapsed, again, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have treatment. Depends on these things, the tempo of change, the presence of symptoms, evidence of uh, significant tumor burden at the beginning of the disease, you know, whether they have a lot of uh, uh, kind of organ uh, involvement, and then also what is their risk, and also how did they present um, with their disease. Okay, so these things requires clinical judgment so clearly have a discussion with your, with your physicians um, when you uh, have, uh, uh, are in this situation and then you know, uh, together reach a, a, a 
a strategy on what to do with the disease. Okay, so that's uh, the end of my presentation. I think we better uh, move on, right? Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Chung. Our next speaker is Madam Diana, Ms. Diana. So uh, she's a senior, senior medical social worker here with NUH, and uh, she'll speak to us more. So hi, everyone. Um, uh, as mentioned, my name is Diana. I'm a social worker here at NUH. So after hearing from our two doctors, you might be wondering, you know, what has love got to do with any of this? So today I'll be sharing with you about love languages. Hopefully, um, you will learn more about what love languages are, why this is relevant and perhaps important to your journey with myeloma, and how this will hopefully help us through the journey with myeloma, as well as through our journey with life. So before I start to share more about love languages, I need to introduce you to the man behind the concept. So Dr. Gary Chapman is actually an author for the Five Love Languages series. And he's, um, he's not a doctor like our two good doctors here, but he's a PhD doctor. And this is the first book that he's, he published, The Five Love Languages, The Secret to Love That Lasts. And basically he published this book after 35 years of marriage counseling, not participating, but he's the one conducting it, and 45 years of his own marriage experience. So in this book, he actually talks about um, the love between married couples, but I think he came to realize after that, that love languages actually apply to all sorts of love. So with all good books and with all good movies, he eventually came out with a series. So there's now a book for singles, there's a book for men, there's a book for teenagers, and there's a book for parents. So basically, in his series of books, he mentions uh, the five and identifies five main emotional love languages. So you can think of it this way. Let's say, um, you know, let's say I love Prof Chung, and for the purpose of today, he has no choice but to love me back. Unfortunately, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, I can only speak Hokkien, and he can only speak French. So if we are going to rely on this love language that we know, which is verbal language, to communicate to each other how much we love each other, I don't think either of us will ever get it. And I think both of us will end up very frustrated. So in the same line, um, the love language is actually a way how we express love, and it affects how we expect others to express love, and it affects whether we ourselves feel loved as well. So I'm not sure whether anyone here has read this series of books and can guess what the five love languages are. So the five main emotional five uh, languages that he actually identified are quality time, words of affirmation, acts of service, physical touch, and receiving gifts. Okay, so we, <laughs> I'll go into each one a little bit more later and there will be a short quiz for you to find out maybe what is your primary love language. So I think it's common that we all have different love languages that we express our love, but usually we will turn to a primary or dominant one. So according, depending on which primary love language we have, um, certain ways that we communicate and certain ways that other people behave actually make us feel more loved or we actually don't feel that loved at all. So maybe can I have a show of hands? Who here thinks their primary love language is quality time? No? no? Okay. So, so for someone whose love, primary love language is quality time, how to communicate is basically to have one-on-one -on -one time with this person, create special moments like taking walks, you know, doing small things with them, and even organizing maybe say a staycation or a weekend getaway. And I think we're all very guilty of this, but basically when we're spending time with that person, try not to have any distractions. So nowadays we're all glued to our mobile phones, but if you're spending time with someone whose primary love language is quality time, maybe put that phone away for a little while and try not to check on it too much. And for someone whose primary love language is words of affirmation, Basically, how to communicate with them, um, praise, encouragement, and acknowledgement is very important to them. So things that you know, they would appreciate would perhaps be writing a little note um, to appreciate them, 
writing some personalized card or even sending a text message. I think instead of forwarding those mass spam messages that we always get, you know, that says the standard Happy New Year for special occasions, we can actually type something that's personalized and send it to this person. Apart from this, do encourage them genuinely. And the keyword here is really genuine. So, you know, when you're frustrated and you say things like, ah, yeah, yeah, la, yeah, la, you're very smart. So that doesn't really count, you know, as words of affirmation. And <laughs> try to give non uh, not try to avoid giving non-constructive criticism, and do try to recognize or appreciate their effort. So if you think that the person with you today, their primary love language is words of affirmation, what you can do after this talk is perhaps turn to them and tell them thank you for spending you know this Saturday morning at this forum with you. So for someone whose primary love language is acts of service. They feel very appreciated when they know that you want to light, uh, when you want to lighten their load. So you can do things like prepare meals for them, help them with household chores, you know, give them a back scrub, give them a massage, even do a mani pedi for them. And so what we can avoid is try not to make other people's requests a priority. So don't tell them things like, um, you know, I'm sorry, I can't do this for you because my friend wants me to do this for him instead. And of course, if you promise to do something for this group of people, they will really appreciate it if you actually follow through with it. So I think it's quite obvious that universally, our mothers are someone who express themselves through acts of service. And can I also have a show of hands? Who here thinks their primary love language is physical touch? <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's quite straightforward. For physical touch, express your love through non-verbal language. You know, you don't have to go to the extent of making out in public and being stomped by everyone. But little things like holding that person's hand, you know, even putting your hand around uh, their, sh their shoulder, giving them hugs, are actually things that are important to them and will make them feel loved. So do also try to receive affection warmly, and then that will help them make, uh, feel loved as well. And the last love language, um, but perhaps important to a lot of us, is receiving gifts. And if your primary love language is receiving gifts, okay, it's not that we are materialistic, but basically what is important is the thought behind that gift. So it doesn't quite matter the size or the price of the gift, although sometimes you know, it does matter to some people. But basically, even small things and small gifts matter. So I think... Uh, something to avoid would be forgetting special occasions. And in the Asian context, I think we are embarrassed to receive a gift. Sometimes we may say things like, yeah, you know why you buy something so expensive? Or don't buy this for me next time again. But actually, deep down inside, we do appreciate it. So for someone whose primary love language is receiving gifts, even receiving a gift warmly from them is something that will make them feel loved. So after learning about these five um, emotional love languages, you might still be thinking, you know, what has this got to do with my Loma? What has this got to do with this forum today? So I have to throw in some theory, right? Because after the two doctors, you know, I need to sound a bit chim as well. So if you look at <laughs> Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, the need to feel love and the need to feel we be that we belong is actually a very primary emotional need. So quite simply, everyone needs to feel loved. And because we are surrounded by people, whether or not we like it all the time, so it could be our parents, it could be our siblings, it could be our children, it could be our spouse, it could be our friends. The need to feel that we are loved and to be significant among them is actually a very strong need. So this love is actually a very important resource. When I asked my patients, you know, how, what helps them get through difficult times, Actually, very often the answer are their family and friends. So everyone needs to feel loved. And if we think of ourselves as cars going on a journey through life, and our journey with myeloma being maybe a very long and bumpy road, so if our love tanks are full, that will actually help us to keep on going. And caring for our emotional well-being is very important as well. So I think apart from knowing what treatments we can receive, what food we should eat, what medication we should take, caring for our heart and our mind is equally as important and will also help us in the road to recovery. So I think if you dig around your goodie bag, you might find some pen and paper. I thought that you know, 
you might be able to guess what your primary love language is already, but I thought, you know, we'll just go through a little quiz to help yourselves understand yourself better. So there will actually be pairs of statements that I show. So between each pair of statements, choose the one that best describes you and write the alphabet down. Okay, so if you're ready, <laughs> um, I'll show the first pair. So basically, A is I like to receive notes of affirmation, and B is I like it when I'm hugged. So between these two pair of statements, choose the one that best describes you and write the alphabet down. So it was, it's really quite quick. It will just take some time doing this. So I'll give everyone some time. Okay, so this is the second pair of statements. And this is the third pair. Let me know if you have difficulties uh, reading it and I'll read it out to you. This is the fourth. This is the fifth. Okay, if everyone is more or less done, we'll move on to the next, the next set. So this is the first one. Oh, go back. Sorry. <laughs> Are we, are we done for this page? I see, oh, no, not yet. <laughs> okay. okay, I will move on to the next page. So maybe when you're more or less done, you can maybe give me some eye contact so I know to move on. Shall I move on? Some knots. Okay, this is the next page. Too fast. Eh? Sorry? Back again. <laughs> okay. Okay, next one. Are we all done? Yep. Okay, next one. Are we good? No? no? <laughs> okay. There, is, there are just two more pages, so don't worry. It's not going to go on endlessly. Okay. 
Are we good? Okay. Are we good? No. <laughs> okay. Next uh next and the last page. Are we are we good? We're good. Okay, so that's the end of the quiz. So what, what I need you to help me do is all the alphabets that you've written down, add up the total number for each alphabet. So how many you've gotten for A's, how many you've gotten for B's, so on and so forth. Uh, yes, so this quiz is easily found if you just Google the five love languages. Yeah, so don't worry. <laughs> you can go home and make your loved ones do it so that you can understand them better too. Is everyone doing good maths? Is everyone nearing, <laughs> nearing the end of your tabulation? Okay, I see everyone hard at work counting the alphabets. So basically, if you scored mostly A's, can you guess what your primary love language is? It is words of affirmation. If you scored mostly B's, your primary love language is quality time. If you scored mostly C's, your primary love language is receiving gifts. Mostly these would be acts of service, and mostly E's would be physical touch. Is anyone here surprised by the outcome of the quiz? Or you pretty much guessed it? Okay, so, so quite interesting, I think, to go through this and get to know yourself a bit better. So the Chinese, I mean, there is this Chinese saying, you know yourself well, you know your enemies well, and you will win every war. So in this context, 
I think knowing what our primary love language is helps us not only to understand ourselves better, but we can understand what fills our love tank um, better. And through that, hopefully what we can do is to communicate with the other party, you know, what our needs are. And I think in this case with the Chinese saying, you know, knowing our enemy better will help us to win the war. So not entirely wrong, but sometimes our enemy is also the one that we love the most. And understanding what fills their love tank or what their love language is helps us to realize that sometimes we may be speaking the same love language. And if we, we are, I think that's the most convenient thing. But if we realize that we are all speaking different love languages, then I think what, what this does, it actually gives us a choice to communicate in a way that can fill up the other party's love tank and communicate in a way that can help them to understand what helps us feel loved as well. And when our love tanks are nearing full rather than nearing empty, I think you will come to realize that it will change the way that it, we treat ourselves. It affects the way that we treat others. And it also affects the way you know, our mind and our heart will actually help us through the recovery process. So with the end of this sharing, I actually hope that you realize that when times are tough, love is actually quite important because it helps in our mental and emotional recovery as well. And also do remember that no matter what, as long as we are open to change and open to communication, I think it's never too late. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Diana. Our next speaker is Madam Nazreen. She's here to share with us more about her journey and fight against myeloma. Can we give her a round of applause, please? Our next speaker is Madam Nazreen. She's here to share with us more about her journey and fight against myeloma. Can we give her a round of applause, please? Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Sorry, I get a bit cough. <clears throat> yeah, my name is Nasrin Ismail. I just done my treatment for the past two years. I had um, myeloma, and um, it's a very tough for me to share my story. Actually, um, honestly, I'm very nervous today. I'm so sorry about it. <clears throat> so <clears throat> it was on um, 2015, it's on the 6th of March. I only had like a back pain on my back, and I doesn't, doesn't know that I had a myeloma on that moment. So my family members uh, was look at me, I was quite serious on my, my symptom on that stage, on, on, on me, I mean on that moment. Uh, they sent me to SGH because on that time I can't walk. I was on the bed all the while, and my family members be helping me for my shower and uh, carry me up on the bed. And I thought it's just a normal sickness I have on my back ache. So, but I doesn't know. So when I've been rushed to hospital in emergency, um, they push me in the ward. Everything. On the next day. I met Dr. Satis, my previous doctor. On that moment, I can say that my tears is never dry. And I really couldn't, couldn't believe that I have such a pain and quite a very, very, very critical on that moment. I can't do anything on that time. I only based on that moment that, that I will live, I, I will no more longer live in this world. So when Dr. Sadis came and looked at me, and he was saying that I have to do my bone marrow for the first treatment. So I asked him, I don't know what is myeloma on the moment, I don't know what is cancer on that time. So when I go through on my bone marrow on the next day, this is my first time treatment doing my bone marrow. It's really hard for me to accept. And I done my MRI on the same day. 
I was quite tired the whole entire day. I've been pushing to MRI department, to my X-ray department, but they cannot detect any of my sickness on that moment. But I keep crying and crying. I said, I cannot stand the pain. The pain is really killing my back. Even though I can't move my body left and right. It's just like a dead body on that moment. It's myself. So when the result came on, about a few days, I think you're not wrong. Exactly on my date of birth is my 50th birthday. Dr. Satis came in the ward and was telling me that it's not actually a birthday present, but um, tell me to be calm and relaxed to accept what you're going to tell me. I said, before you're going to tell me anything, I can feel myself that I'm a cancer patient. Then he said, yes. So he asked me to be more brave and don't think much. Don't think that you are dying. Don't think anything. Always think that you always have to be more positive on your life. So on that stage, I said, okay, carry on with the treatment. So I done with the treatment uh, about three weeks in hospital. I was on the bed. The nurses sponged me everything, uh, even though I can't walk. So Dr. Satish was worried about me on that moment. And I keep asking him, can I walk? Because I just on the bed for the past three weeks. I said, I'm scared. I said that. I'm scared I can't walk anymore. I, can't, I said that I'm scared that I won't be to be like a normal person. He said, you don't worry. This is upon myself. I have to be fight for it. And Dr. Sati said, always been telling me that I'm a doctor and you have to pray hard for it. So he's, he's a part of being helping me all the while. So I said, okay. So all I go through the treatments that I was three weeks in the ward, I've been discharged again. So I started my chemo. In the ward, at the same time, I was in chemo. But my chemo is not that strong. My chemotherapy is not that strong on that moment. So when I've been discharged, I have to go for my chemotherapy every uh, three weeks, every week, twice, twice in a week, for the past about four months, four to five months, if I'm not wrong. So on the August, I went for my cell transplant. And I was very, very scared. Then, because I, I, I never go through all these things. And he said, Nazrin, don't be scared. You have to be more strong. I know you can do it. I said, Dr. Satis, doing all this transplant is not a easy, easy for me to accept. When I see some patient that what they go through, they're sharing their experience on me. When I look at them, when they told me their story, I feel so scared all that time. And my tears will never dry. I keep crying all the days. And when I reach home, all the side effects I have from my chemo is from my back. I can't sleep the whole entire night for the past few months. And my back is really, aching is very, very strong. I still like, sometimes I get mad on myself. I get angry on my own. Sometimes I tell myself why I can't be like a normal person back. But my support from my family said you have to be more patient. Just, just don't think anything. Just like feel like you are just a normal person. But I said I can't. The tears keep going down every day. And, it, and the fear is always come to me. It's always the fear is always come to me. So when I done, he said, okay, I have to do your, your cell transplant. Okay. I said that. But he told me that on your cell transplant, you have to, the chemotherapy will be double dose. Okay. And... Um, he said, it will help you let the cells grow and easy for them to, to do the cell transplant. I said, is it very dangerous for me? He said, no, Nazrin. I know you can do it. I said, okay. So I go through my cell transplant. I was in the ward about three weeks. Okay, they, sort of, they make a plug on my neck. And uh, okay, everything was success. So they've been collected my cells from, uh, it's about eight millions. Okay, so after I've been discharged everything, I have to go back again for my chemotherapy for two months. For two months, for every week. Before, my last treatment is my transplant. If you talk about the oral medication, to me, it's just like having my breakfast every day. Day and night. 
day and night. And then before my chemotherapy, I have to take half an hour before my chemotherapy, I have to take about 15 tablets before my chemotherapy started. I said, okay. So what I've been, uh, been concerned for my doctor, I never said no to, to my doctors. I always say yes and yes and yes. Even though what happened to me, I can't walk. I was on my wheelchair. My family members was carrying me. I still go to the hospital without fail. So he said, Nazrin, okay, this is your last treatment for your transplant. And I was very worried about my transplant. I was very, very scared. The fear come back to me again. I would say, Dr. Satis, on that moment, I said no. He said, no, Nazrin, this is your last treatment. You have to go for it. If you said no, I will never say anything to you. So you've done everything out for the past about a year. So this is your last treatment. So before I done my last treatment on my transplant, there will be, he told me about, be about triple dose of chemotherapy on me. And um, it's quite strong and have to be very, very strong on the stage. This is my new hair, actually. I've been lost my hair twice. Yeah. So, um, when before I started my transplant, the last transplant, I confronted Dr. Satis by personal. He was telling me, okay, Nazrin, now what you want to say, what you want to lay out, please, by all means, just lay out everything, fear, everything inside my heart, just tell him. So, I really do that. I mean, I talked to him by personally. I just like a small baby crying because I'm very, very scared on that, on that moment, really scared. So he convinced me with support, with his support. He said, don't worry, I know you can do it. So when I think the other way around for, my, for myself, and I want to be back like a normal person again, I go through for my trans last transplant. And to be very honest with you, when I had my last transplant, it's like, it's, I think it will be a double fear for me. It's really, really very, very fear for me. I have to do everything with the triple dose chemotherapy. And my body is very weak. I have no appetite. And I can't do anything. But I thanks a lot with the nurses and the doctors on that moment. Was always keep being looking at me in the ward. Every 15 minutes, they came to the to my room and check on me. And on that stage, I think if I'm not wrong, my platelet, my potassium was really going down very, very low. And a lot of people said that doing the transplant, our life is about 50-50. And with support from my family and support from the doctors and the nurses, I think I shouldn't listen to anybody. It's myself. If my own heart and my own sincere that, okay, I go through all the treatments. When doing the trust transplant, honestly, tears again will never stop. I was keep crying all the while, keep crying with one of the doctors, the nurses. I always, tell, I always ask them, am I dying? Am I dying? They said, no. Because the last transplant, to be very honestly, is very, very tough. It's not simple as some patient that they can really do the transplant. Some of the patients that I met, they doesn't want to do the, the, the transplant at all. But when they look at me, I said, no, you have to go for it. We have to fight. We have to fight for our cancer. We cannot rely on everybody. Support is from our own and love is from our own. So I thank God. I did go through the transplant. And um, it's about three, three to four weeks I was in the ward. I came out. I rest about three weeks. But I have to, see for my, I have to go for my follow-up checkup every week in with Dr. Satis. And after that, after three months done, I have to come back for my chemotherapy for two months again. And I never skip either one of the treatments in the hospital, no matter what happened to me. I never skip not even a day. 
and my journey is quite far actually from from uh, from hospital to my house but i always tell myself that i want to be strong i want to be back to normal life and what chemotherapy has has on me is on my body for quite some time then always people was be asking me is is the chemotherapy is pain is the chemotherapy is that i said no chemotherapy is not pain it is not pain at all only the side effect that you have on the chemotherapy is like partly maybe of your uh, maybe like a bone a bone aching uh, maybe you feel uncomfortable not like like a normal person actually um I think that much that I go through on my chemotherapy. And um, after that, on my uh, chemo, after two, 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 two months, yeah, I have to go for my another bone marrow transplant. And I think, I know, when doing the bone marrow transplant, it's not that easy also. It's the same thing, the tears will never dry. I have to, I have to be like, I have to be that a normal person when I, I done my bone marrow, I just ignore the pain, I just ignore everything. And I always assume myself that I go to SGH to meet my doctors, my nurses, my friends there. It's like I went to the shopping mall. And I never think that I go to SGH is I'm I'm a sick I'm a sick person, I'm a cancer patient, no. So I have to be very strong on it. Really, really to be strong. If I don't have that strong, I have to be, I have to think about my family members also. You see? And I done also my bone marrow last, it's okay. And I went for my PEP scan. And I thank God what I go through on my, my, my myeloma and the result came, everything is good. I can say that my myeloma may be not even the one percent now. Okay? And after Dr. Sati left, he went to and at the hospital. So in charge of me now is Dr. Mauli, been looking after me now. And here I am. I have to be more cheerful to you all. And I hope, please, the fear that we have in our, 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 our life, ourselves, you just throw aside. Just be cheerful to yourself and don't think that cancer will make us die. No. And I really hope that Maybe if some of my friends said that they haven't got any transplant or whatever. You don't be scared and be more positive. If I can stand here right in front of everybody here, so why don't you be like me? I think nothing much to say. That is my true experience. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Nazreen. Okay, can we please invite Dr. Mauli and Prof. Cheng up on stage? And, and Ms. Diana as well, so sorry. <laughs> can we have you up on stage? Any questions? So while people are, as usual, waiting, I've got a question for Diana, actually. That love language is very interesting. I did a survey and what happens if you, are, you score the same for more than one category? If you are like the same score for A, B, and C, does it mean? I mean, uh, can people have kind of like more than one love language and so on? Yeah. So I think while we may have one dominant love language, if we score quite similarly for a few, it means that these are the dominant ones that we have. Yeah. So depending on what you scored, it means that. If the person you love expresses their love for you in the languages that correspond to what you scored, then quite likely you will feel more appreciated. Like for example, if let's say my love language is physical touch, but someone I love maybe always gives me presents, I may feel that something is lacking, but I may not really realize what it is until understanding a bit more about you know, what love languages each other use to express. In the... In the book that you read on this, if the couple's love language are very incompatible, does it lead to more kind of like, you know, it almost seems like people should do this survey before they got married, you know, it's like, it's now it's a bit too late, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, 
maybe I shouldn't ask my wife to do it just in case I... <laughs> I think I think what he talked about in the book was that he realized that some couples, after getting married for a period of time, they feel that the love has faded. Or they feel that, you know, they don't feel that loved anymore. And then they wonder whether they made the right decision, perhaps being in this mar marriage with this person. But then he realizes that, you know, I mean, we assume that they still love each other. Then it all boils down to the way that they express their love is actually quite different. So I think having this knowledge is quite powerful because it helps us understand that, you know, it's not that this person doesn't love us. I have patients telling me that, you know, my husband, he doesn't care for me even though I'm sick. You know, he keeps nagging at me, asking me to eat this, eat that, but he doesn't realize I have no appetite. But actually this husband is just expresses, expressing his love in a way that doesn't match what the patient expects you know, to feel loved by uh, yeah. So I think having this knowledge is actually helpful because not, not say that you realize that, uh oh, my love language with my spouse is very different and this is not going to work out. But rather knowing that, <laughs> that difference, then you realize that you can communicate this to the person and having understood then maybe the person can try to express their love in a way that will, that will make you feel love as well. Any questions from the audience? Yes, Yui. Um, maybe. Uh, yes, good morning. Can I ask about CAR T cells? I know that it's not a mainstream treatment, but I am just wondering what the idea is. Is it something that is going to produce a deeper response, more probable response? What, what are we trying to achieve? And the second question is, when it becomes mainstream, is it going to be a replacement for the transplant or is it going to be the replacement for chemo drugs? <clears throat> I'll start off. I think, uh, unfortunately, at this stage, we are not at a um, uh, stage where we can answer all the, all the kind of questions that you have mentioned. It's too early at this point in time um, for CAR T cells in myeloma. The, idea, the basic idea is you, it, it's a form of immunotherapy, as we call it. So rather than using you know, um, you know, drugs like chemicals and stuff, we use our own, you know, all of us have very effective immune cells which are able to tackle cancer and to be Honest, why uh, the patients who do not develop cancer do not develop cancer is not because they have never had cancer. Maybe there are cells which are turning cancer, cancerous within them, but there is an arm of our immune system which can deal with such cells become, which become quote unquote naughty and cancerous. The immune, immune system is able to handle and get rid of those cells quickly before it's, it gets to a stage where it actually becomes a full blown cancer. So it's kind of extrapolating the same idea a bit more. Uh, so what they actually do is collecting the type of white cells called T cells, and that's why it's called CAR T cells. Uh, the word CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cells. So uh, we collect the T cells from the patient. In the lab, they are genetically engineered in such a way that um, the, the T cells are able to deal or kind of educated to deal with the cancer that the patient has. There are mechanisms that within uh, the patient that kind of um, um, overwhelms or able to escape this kind of immune system that is there in everybody. So this genetic engineering can, you know, is kind of trying to um, you know, overcome that escape mechanism that the cancer cells have developed and hence kind of re-educate them to go and attack these cancer cells. So that is what happens by these genetic engineering mechanisms that happen in the lab. So when the T cells are put back into the patient, they know where the cancer is and how uh, you know, to get to them. And you know, uh, by their own uh, means of attacking the cancer cells, they get over it. So that's what happens. That is the theory behind it. Uh, now, there are lots of hoops to cross when it comes to practice and getting this as a treatment approach. Uh, in, in, in a new place. You need a lot of, uh, you know, um, for example, a GMP lab, as we call it. So it has to be, you know, collecting stem cells, you know, changing it in the environment and putting back. It involves a lot of, um, you know, technical aspects that needs to happen. So it will come to Singapore. I know for a fact that there are, uh, you know, steps being taken in Singapore as we speak to try and get this treatment up and going. Um, as with any treatment, you only get one chance to get it right first time. So we need to make sure that we have absolutely everything all along the way, not just the lab aspects, the clinical aspects and everything that goes with it before we can you know, put it up as an approach for treatment and try it on patients because at the end of the day, this is you know, real patients that we are dealing with. 
Um, some of the other questions were, you know, whether there's going to be replacement for anything. I mean, um, the trials that we have seen so far have been in patients who have had relapsed myeloma. So they've had one, two, three, how many other therapies. And then if they reach a stage where they haven't got any more drugs to be tried on, uh, they are the patients who have had, uh, you know, CAR T cells. This is overseas, including China and, and the trials that have run in the U.S. Uh, and those patients seem to, do, seem to have done well um, in that, that they, many of them get to the stage of complete remission. But the follow-up data, uh, you know, as, as with most studies, we need a longer-term follow-up. If it emerges, whether it emerges to be like a, you know, a one-time treatment where myeloma um, is gone and it stays like that after this one course of treatment, or whether it's something like many other drugs that it controls the myeloma for a certain period of time, and then the myeloma comes back, it's, it's something that we still need to wait and see. So we've not reached that stage yet. Yeah, so I, I agree with well, generally what Molly said. I mean, the, the, the development of CAR-T is still very early days. The data is very exciting, and so there's a lot of excitement all over the world, particularly in lay press. There's a lot of high-profile cases, particularly um, in the field of acute leukemia, childhood acute leukemia. It is a potentially curative uh, treatment, so there's a lot of hype around this. But in myeloma, the trials have been going on for you know only one or two years. The data so far is very exciting, but these are in relapse settings. So you know we're asking question whether you can replace transplant and so on, which is in the earlier phase. There's no trial in that area yet, but I'm pretty sure if it's a very effective treatment in relapse disease, people will start to use it earlier on and see how it can fit into the current treatment uh, strategy. The limitation is actually the logistics is involved actually because. <clears throat> I think what Mali described about the GMP and so on, there are for the CAR T trials that we may be developing and doing ourselves, say in the academic institutions in Singapore. But for the commercialized CAR T, like your Novartis uh, CAR T and so on, in fact, that wouldn't be the case. It would be centrally manufactured. So the sites will collect their cells, send it to a Novartis central facility, they will engineer it and it will come back. So what that means is that it takes time. Um, and we've speaking to other investigators, sometimes the patient uh, cells cannot be engineered, so it's not 100%. Sometimes there will be failure there. Number two is sometimes the time taken is so long that the patient cannot survive long enough to get the cells back, um, especially for aggressive disease, because it may take up to three, four weeks for the, the, the process to complete. So these are still the current uh, limitations um, uh, of the, the technique. Right? So, but the field is growing very fast. So I'm sure next year when we have this forum, there will be more results. There may be better ways to do the CAR-T you know, off the shelf rather than needing patients' uh, uh, cells and all those things. So I think it's an exciting area that we can look forward to, but at the present time, it's more in the research. Other questions? Yes, sir. <coughs> Thanks, Prof. Uh, if you are too old for transplant, is the, is the uh, treatment less effective? Number two, how long does it take before the relapse comes when you're on remission? And what treatment do you get if you have a, re a relapse? Thanks. Yeah, so um, I think the, the issue with... Um, you know, the, nowadays, I mean, first thing to say is that nowadays we actually do transplant until quite old, you know. We have transplanted patients that are about 70-year-old. I hear Dr. Go Yao Ti from SGH told me that he's transplanted someone 75 years old. You know, so age itself is not an absolute contraindication to transplant. It all depends on how physically fit uh, the person is because we could have quite old people, but they are running marathons, right? I mean, we could have young people that are already in heart failure and not being able to do much. So I think a lot depends on the physical state. And we can see from Dr. Maoli's uh, presentation, he showed a curve where <coughs> patients who have transplant have a much better outcome. I think that partly relates to the fact that these are younger patients anyway. So, you know, the, the older patients, because usually of their other medical condition, um, the outcome may not be as good as the young people, right? Um, but if you are unable to uh, have the transplant for various reasons, um, there are still very good treatment for elderly patients uh, 
that we have today, you know, and um, uh, I'm pretty sure if you have a Valcade based induction, you still have a good chance of getting into remission, good chance maybe more than 50%. And when you're in remission or you get a good response, when would your disease come back again is different for different people, you know. So it depends a lot on the individual. I think the other thing to say is all these figures that we quote are for average. You know, so it's not necessary for you. It, it, it may not apply to you. You know. So I think every patient is different and we just need to know that in time to come, the disease may come back. This is part and parcel of having myeloma and the treatment. Um, what it means is I need to go to my doctors for follow-up so that we can pick this uh, relapse early and start treatment early when necessary, not until when it's too late. Right when we have very severe symptoms. Um, so just be vigilant, but every patient is a bit different. Of course, at the beginning of the diagnosis, when you have high-risk features and so on, you may get a clue that your disease may come back earlier. But I would say that that's still depending on individual. We have high-risk patients where the disease have stayed uh, in remission for a long time before it come back as well. So every patient is different. And I guess when the disease come back, the good news for myeloma patient is now we have many new treatments not just new treatment, we have many new old treatments. That means treatments that have been here for a long time but still relatively new and then we have even newer treatments. So there's really many treatment choice for patients now when the disease come back. Uh, so actually sometimes we like to say that myeloma is becoming like a chronic illness that you may need to have treatment on and off for a very long period of time but the patients are surviving for a long period of time. So, like high blood pressure, diabetes, you know, these are conditions that are not cured. The patients need to take medicine for the rest of their life, right? But they live, because of good disease control, they can live for a long period of time now. And myeloma is not diabetes, clearly, but it's, it's more serious. But the patients are living very long now, and that's because we have very good treatment. Some of the new treatments are already highlighted by... Dr. Maoli in his talk as well. So every year when we go to the American meetings, we come back with new treatment options, new exciting development for treatment. Um, so I think the great thing is that uh, for myeloma patients, there's tremendous hope um, because there's many new treatment options and the treatment are becoming more and more effective. So the time before the disease come back is also getting longer. You know, so I think that's the, the main take home message. Uh, from me, at least. Molly, you have anything? To I just had a couple of things to, to, to specifically answer your question. You absolutely nailed it there when you asked the question. So, so patients who are not able to have a transplant for whatever reason, uh, you know, and, and we don't tend to be ageist at all, as, as Prof. Shang was saying. So for whatever reason, like medical conditions or other comorbid conditions, the patient is not able to have a transplant. Okay. It is important to have effective treatments in that population of patients and you know uh, throughout the world the myeloma uh, you know community is coming up with more effective treatments up front to try and uh, at least in, in this specific population to try and control the disease better such that uh, we don't have a big gap between the transplanted patients and the non-transplant patients but there are still going to be limitations and as with most hematological cancers it seems like uh, invariably these patients who are not fit for transplant are likely to be older um, and, and hence, the disease itself seems to be a little bit different in, a, in the older population compared to more younger, younger patients. So that's one second. So treatment and transplant are different um, aspects. So the fact that the patient does not have a transplant, is not able to have a transplant, doesn't mean that the treatment itself is going to be less or more effective. Uh, obviously, they, they might need to be on longer courses of treatment because they haven't had a transplant. They you know, might need to be on maintenance and so on. So that, that's the other thing. Other questions? Yes, David. Thank you, Prof and team, for the enlightening uh, talk. Uh, my question may sound a bit... Uh, Weird or stupid. Uh, when I was first diagnosed with multiple myeloma, apparently it's more, it affects more of the elderly, right? I was 44 then and I felt very old. <laughs> <laughs> but I've, uh, by the grace of God, I've, uh, it's, I think it's the 15th year now. So my question is, uh, as many of us here have crossed the 10th year period, I wonder how many uh, in your studies have crossed over more than 10 or for me now almost 15. 
uh, I do get a little worried. <laughs> My boy was only four, four years old today. This, uh, soon he'll be 18. Uh, on one hand, I'm glad, but on the other hand, sometimes I do have a little bit of the apprehension. Uh, my markers do go up and down, although it's still in a safe uh, region. Uh, my principal doctor is not too concerned about it, but uh, you know, maybe just hear your insight on that. Yeah, I mean, again, Mao Liu will add uh, his thoughts on this later on, but uh, I think in general now, everywhere in the world in their practice, uh, they would have long survivors, you know, I mean, and, and these would constitute about 10 percent of all the patients that we see uh, maybe and the interesting thing is that these long survivors if you look back right like David say he was treated 15 years ago you know people who have survived 10 years would have been treated at least 10 years or more ago and those days we could be using actually nothing like the very good treatment that we have today you know they could be chemotherapy they could be transplant and so on so they clearly are uh, you know, uh, elements of the biology of the disease. Some people just have good disease that can do very well. The other thing to say also is David had an allogeneic transplant, right, um, from a donor. That is something that we don't discuss much about uh, usually when we talk about myeloma because not many pa patients will go through that kind of uh, treatment because it is a much, it is a more dangerous uh, treatment and because most myeloma patients are old, uh, they will not be um, suitable candidates for this kind of treatment. So as David mentioned, he's only 40-something when he had the diagnosis, and uh, it turned out to be a good choice for him. It is more risky, but he had reaped the benefit of uh, this. And up to today, I think allo transplant remain um, you know, the, the treatment that potentially could lead to long-term disease control and, and, and cure sometimes uh, for this myeloma condition. And if you think about it, uh, the allo transplant, in fact, is the old-fashioned way of doing T-cell therapy because you are infusing someone else's T-cell that may recognize your tumor cells as a foreign bacteria or something and control it and kill it, right? Except that now we have a much uh, refined method of making these T-cells so that the chances of success will be higher. You know, so in fact, allo transplant is a kind of immunotherapy that has been around for a long time. It's just that it's a much riskier procedure. So we all have these uh, types of patients, either because they have done well with uh, allo transplant or because the nature of their disease is such that they are easier to control. So those people that have survived for more than 10 years on treatment on and off, you know, we do have uh, these patients, but I think it's about... 10%. The idea now with all these new treatments is hopefully we can gradually increase that percentage up in the future to like 30%, 40%. Uh, that, is, that is the kind of uh, target that we hope to achieve. Uh. But uh, I think the other point that David say is that it's not always a disease of the elderly. We have seen some remarkable cases. I have a patient in her 20s. You know, there's 20-something with multiple myeloma. And really in those patients, when we show these statistics that you can survive 10 years, or whatever, it's completely meaningless to, to her or to that patient because in 10 years' time, she's only going to be 30-something. She's too young. So in those patients, we will um, discuss with her the options of doing something like an allo transplant where the gains potentially for her is so much higher compared to the, to the potential risk. You know, it's a very different discussion if you are in your 60s, you know, about what you want in life and what you hope to achieve with treatment. I think so. Those are the, 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 the unique things. Mao you have Ed Shou. Uh, I just want to uh, let you know, David, that there's no stupid question. Yeah. I often tell my patients the only stupid question is the one that you don't ask. So thank you for that question. I think uh, one, one more thing to add is, you know, w one way to look at it positively in your, in your situation may be because your disease was treated so long ago, uh, you wouldn't, uh, your disease kind of hasn't seen any of these novel drugs. Not that I, you know, I hope that the disease stays like this and you never have to see any of these drugs, but, you know, that, that's one way to look at it positively. We looked at the data of the so-called long-term survivors some time ago, and we, we had a, you know, for the amount of patients that we see year on year, we do have a, you know, a, a small but certain population of long-term survivors who lived past 10 to 15 years. If I remember at the top of my head, it was about 30 to 40 patients in, 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 in SG, seen in SG. GH that have uh, you know crossed beyond that and well and alive at this point. Any other other questions?
No questions. I think this audience has become more and more educated in my loma. Next time they should be. Next time we should try to get those that has been with us for uh, all this time to be the lecturers. <laughs> then we uh, let's try that next time.